Bosses, bosses, bosses. I love me some bosses from all sorts of games of all different genres. Action, horror, RPG, Metroidvania, Killer7, which is its own damn genre as far as I'm concerned, and whatever the hell else. But when it comes to the absolute god tier of boss quality, and indeed boss visual design, well by golly the FromSoft games have just about everything else beaten. And speaking of which, last week I put out a video ranking the top 15 sickest Soulsborne boss designs, but specifically for armoured bosses like The Looking Last Night, Executioner Smo, etc. Now though, it's time to name what I consider the top 15 sickest monster boss designs. And by monster, I mean entities which either don't wear armour or don't have obtainable armour sets and which do not resemble a normal human. Bosses like, say, the Armour Spider from Demon Souls, the Demon of Song from Dark Souls 2, Worm Face from Elden Ring, etc, etc. There's loads of candidates. Also, I will be considering Sekiro's bosses for the list, even if it is a somewhat different style of game to Souls, Bloodborne and Elden Ring. It's just to make the pool of bosses to choose from that bit deeper. Final thing to clarify before I get stuck in is that the actual quality of the boss encounters is not relevant to my rankings. I'm ranking them based on things like their aesthetics and associated lore and stuff, so even if I think a boss kind of sucks, it's still got a great chance of ranking well as long as I think it looks really freaking sick. If you like the video, hey, why not subscribe to the channel? I make fun videos about great games. And lastly, please allow me to give a fond thank you to my kind patrons for their support for the channel. And on that note, let's get this show on the road. At number 15 I have the Death Rite Bird, found at various locations throughout Elden Ring's The Land Between. Of course, we can't discuss the Death Rite Birds without first mentioning their slightly less terrifying cousins. Those being the Death Birds, with both variants only ever appearing at night, often swooping in from above when you least expect it. Although you can find them in several earlier places, my first encounter with a death bird was in the Landell outskirts, over by those particularly morbid snails. I was kind of blown away by it when it did thunder down, thinking it was a unique boss FromSoft had just thrown in specifically for this random spot, before later realising that there were literally another 7 death birds or death right birds elsewhere in the game. But regardless, very cool moment. Now, I like birds. I wouldn't go so far as to call myself any sort of fledgling ornithologist or anything, but birds make me laugh and smile. But there's nothing funny about death birds, beings which heavily toy with your idea of the form of a bird, dispensing with the bright plumage and the musical piping in favour of dark, necrotized skin and bones, black talons, a hideously deformed bent spinal structure, and most strikingly of all, that beaked eyeless skull. The dark voids which make up its eye sockets are terrible to behold, heavily enforcing the idea that you're fighting some unholy, animated, emotionless set of living bones. Mind you, despite its cadaverous appearance, it still features a small set of feathery wings which allow it a bit of extra height in its jumps, although these collections of feathers pale in comparison to the wide, shadowy wingspans of the Death Right Birds. These entities also have a tendency to surprise you from above in certain places, but one encounter I had that always sticks in my mind was when I was roaming around the rotted wastes of Caled at night, only to see some huge stalking thing in the distance, not hidden and poised for an ambush, but just there in the open to be either challenged or avoided, depending on how much of a big bitch you are. Most of the Deathrite Bird's physical structure is the same as the weaker variant, with the exception of the wings, though they also have an added ghost flame glow adorning their skull and weapons. Whereas regular Death Birds have no ghost flame capabilities, that otherworldly cold fire that causes frost buildup of all things, freezing and burning with that distinctive deathly white-grey hue. Regarding the wings, for as impressive and intimidating as they appear, I initially just thought they were composed of some ambiguous dark spectral energy, though on closer inspection and upon reading the item description for the Death Ritual Spear dropped by the one on the mountaintops of the giants near Castle Sol, the wings are made up of ghostly figures holding said Ritual Spears, priests of old who became guardians of the birds through the rites of death, hence the name Death Rite Bird. The weapon which the boss itself uses is not a spear though, instead being the Death's Poker, a great sword of sorts, which used to be heavily favoured by speedrunners thanks to its hilariously overpowered Ash of War, Ghost Flame Ignition, which might just be one of the sickest names for an attack I've ever heard. 
I've always found Deathbirds to be a nightmare to fight, to the extent that for as awesome as they look, I actually barely enjoy fighting with them at all, due to their skeletal structure which renders their lower body largely out of reach when you're in front of them. Mind you, it's not that tricky to overcome the regular ones, but with Death Right Birds, you've also got those constant ghost flame conflagrations going on, and the occasional ancient death rancor, spear call ritual, and several other such loud, explosive attacks, which make the boss experience way more challenging, yes, but also bloody hell, what a spectacle. Definitely one of the best looking bosses in Elden Ring in my eyes, and it's not even a mandatory one, but rather just another of the many fascinating and mysterious beings found throughout the lands between. Let's go all the way back to ye olde demon souls for number 14, to the level boss of the first level of the Shrine of Storms, the Adjudicator. A boss of this visual character is probably the absolute last thing most players expect to see at the end of Island's Edge, a level brimming with metallic skeletons, complemented by the alien forms of the storm beasts flowing through the air, periodically sending out green crystal projectiles, but then you enter through that fog gate and are faced with a… I mean, it's just a massive yellow fat dude with a long tongue and a bird for a head, but we're just talking about birds. I guess the boss design doesn't strictly come out of nowhere though, because a bit earlier on in the level, you can pick up the Adjudicator's shield, which colourfully depicts its namesake's design on its front. Really cool looking shield, and while Demon Souls may generally be quite sparse in its in-game written lore, the item description of the shield reads, Cowardly acts and the eating of birds must not be the deeds of a hero of storms. If the one being judged displeases the Adjudicator's master, the Golden Crow, the deceased soul will be gnawed upon until nothing but their bones remain. Thus, this rotund, long-tongued rascal is a judge of sorts, devouring the souls of humans the bird deems unworthy, which, judging by the Adjudicator's size, probably amounts to a great many dead and eaten heroes. The 2020 remake of the game, for the most part, kept the designs of things pretty much identical to the original, only significantly buffing up the graphics and detail. But the Adjudicator is an example of a boss whose character Bluepoint made look quite different, not unlike what they did with the Vanguard. In the original, its skin and clothing has a very yellow aspect to it, matching the bright golden glow of its bird head, and also having it share a visual characteristic with the old hero found in the Shrine of Storm's second level, who also glows. But in the remake, that yellow aspect is straight up gone, replaced with folds upon folds of gross grey flesh, increasing the disgust factor. I'd still think it looks pretty great, but certainly not as interesting or unique as in the original, instead making it look more like just a really, really big fat guy with a bird for a head. One thing they didn't change in the remake, of course, was its moveset, which is a shame because it actually needed changing. The Adjudicator literally has just two moves, either its long-range tongue attack or its semi-impotent butcher chop. Like I said though, the overall quality of the fight doesn't matter here, it's the design I'm assessing, and I really think the Adjudicator is up there as one of the best. This time let's make way for Bloodborne. Sadly, I did not include any Bloodborne bosses in my top 15 sickest armour boss designs video from last week, not because I don't think German and Gascoigne and that don't look great, but just because there was some really stiff competition with the Souls games and Elden Ring. But now, it's Bloodborne's time to shine, because if we're talking about monsters, then it has some of the best and most interesting, and speaking of which, my first Bloodborne boss of the list is Amygdala, found at the end of the Nightmare Frontier. Of course, there's a big lead up before the actual encounter, even before meeting up with Patches the Spider in the Forbidden Woods Village. If you've got at least 40 insight and happen to find yourself in Cathedral Ward, you'll see a lesser amygdala hanging hideously from Odin Chapel, making you go, what the hell is that? Because at that point in the game, there's been nothing else that looks like it. Sure, you've got your beasts, villagers and pigs, but not this. Though later on in Yahargul, they are present in number, again clinging to buildings like monstrous spiders, fully visible to all now that the red moon hangs low, and even throwing out violent otherworldly attacks from above, like its crush portal move, or the particularly explosive laser attack, obliterating hunter and frenzied villager alike. It's not until making it to the end of the Nightmare Frontier though as you approach the tall tower which has been beckoning you as you wander through the level that an amygdala actually jumps down and fights you, letting you see exactly what one of these great ones is capable of when they choose to truly engage a human instead of idly sending out attacks from above. 
Sometimes with the less human bosses in these games, for as messed up as they may look, there's often still one or more real life creatures which the design is based on, except warped and made far more monstrous. But as far as I'm aware, the Amygdala has no real world parallel. Everything about its design is anomalous, from its six arms, the extra joint on each arm, the six fingers on each hand, and the hard, stubby tail, but above all, the bizarre form of its head appearing vaguely like a sort of caged brain. Although the name Amygdala actually comes from a small almond-shaped structure inside the brain, the primary function of which is to process what you see and hear, to then use that input to learn what's dangerous, so that if you encounter something similar in the future, your Amygdala may cause you to feel fear or similar emotions. I don't know how much of this was considered meaningful and relevant when Miyazaki or whoever else was putting together the lore and designs for Bloodborne, but that's a pretty damn cool connection. How the boss looks though is just one part of its design, because you've also got its attacks and animations to give it all life and character, and my favourite visual flair is the way the eyeballs appear from the small holes in its head whenever it's doing a laser attack. Bloodborne's eye theme is everywhere, as per that morbid notion that higher wisdom and eldritch insight can only be gained by literally lining one's brain with eyes, with some characters even rejecting conventional sight by wearing blindfolds or bandages around the eyes so as to better focus on true sight, to see what your normal eyes refuse to see. There's actually something I like even better than Amygdala's whole eye thing though. Regular viewers of mine who've seen my other boss videos might know by now that for me, one of the coolest things a boss or enemy can do is rip its own arm off. It was awesome when the last giant did it in Dark Souls 2, but it's even more sick when the Amygdala does it here. Just the deafening, desperate roar it lets out when it abruptly happens, and the way blood constantly spurts out from the stumps for the rest of the fight as it tries to flatten you with its own torn off limbs, which both give it extra range and make the fight harder by giving you two fewer vulnerable body parts to attack. Not the best boss in the game, and it's certainly not situated in the best level of the game, but design wise, it's a great one. At number 12 we have our first, though certainly not last, dragon, with Elden Ring's Leech Dragon Fortisax, hidden away within Fia's deathbed dream as she wades beside the gargantuan, festering corpse of Godwin, Prince of Death. Even though Fortisax is a remembrance boss, it's actually possible to permanently lose the chance to fight it if you happen to kill Fia before the end of her questline, though you can go up against non-named variants of the Leech Dragon in Crumbling for Am Azua, or you could take on Lanziax in Altus Plateau, all of whom make use of Red Lightning, the lightning of the ancient dragons. Even though it has its variants though, Leech Dragon Fortisax itself is quite visually distinct compared to the others. Its most noteworthy feature is its blackened and corrupted scales, many of which have begun falling off over time to reveal the traces of gold beneath, though Fortisax did not always look like this. In fact, it most likely once appeared similarly bright and glorious to Lanziax, but when Godwin became the Prince of Death after the murder of his soul on the Night of the Black Knives, Fortisax fought long and hard against the death within his companion, though without victory, eventually resulting in its own corruption. The death aspect isn't just a visual flair though, instead also having a real effect on the actual fight. For example, the dragon's death lightning attack leaves behind clouds of death blight, adding an additional arena hazard not used by any of the game's other dragons. Most of Fortisax's attacks are made of red lightning, but the initial colour of its death lightning is yellow, because this was an ability which Godwin himself taught to the dragon prior to his deathly transformation though now even this yellow lightning has itself been made rotten along with the dragon. The most striking corruption effect for me though isn't even the boss, but rather the blotchy, ulcerated, rotten look of the skybox, which happens to be the same, or at least a very similar, skybox pattern that appears in the Dung Eater's ending. As we know, Elden Ring has a bloody lot of dragons in it. In fact, if you include the magma worms, there are 12 named dragons, and that's without taking the unnamed ones into account, not to mention the lesser dragons stomping around in northern Caelid, and these fights can be pretty damn chaotic when you've got fire or frost or magic or rot flying everywhere, but the most chaotic of them all has to be the Fortisax battle. You're constantly hounded by red lightning as you run, not to mention the lightning glaives, spears and sparking after effects from its claw attacks. Then you've got the yellow lightning of Godwin and the cloying death blight it leaves behind, and all the while this blackened death tainted dragon rampages around the arena. And this is a big bloody dragon by the way. 
It's just a chaotic profusion of colourful sparks, waves and explosions. The most interesting dragon designs are always those which add a unique twist to the recipe, and for Fortisax, that twist is death. For number 11, I have chosen the Curse Rotted Greatwood, a great example of a boss that I don't consider very good, but which I think looks absolutely awesome. The arena itself is initially quite something, being a large open area with blooms of violet flowers creeping up from the cracks in the ground, while a group of undead villagers are sat in apparent prayer to some odd wooded mass in the corner, but get close enough and that mass comes to life as the curse rotted great wood. The great wood came about after a particularly terrible curse came to the undead settlement, going on to seep into a spirit tree. We can get an idea of what a typical spirit tree would have looked like as per the depictions on the spirit tree shields which appear in both Dark Souls 2 and 3, essentially looking like a blue version of the album cover for Gajira's The Link. But now that the tree has been thoroughly tainted by the curse, it has taken on a very different form, sprouting arms and legs, lacking the proportions required for conventional movement, instead only being capable of slowly dragging its enormous weight around the arena. Due to its size, most of this boss's attacks aren't executed with any real attempt at accuracy, but rather it's just heaving its body around, swinging its arms and dropping rotten fruits from its upper branches which burst open upon hitting the ground, exploding out with a damaging spray of rancid yellow juice. I originally thought these objects that fell were just that, weird fruit, but upon closer inspection or by looking at the Great Woods concept art, you can see that they actually have arms dangling from them, implying that there's bodies in there, either giving in sacrifice by the villagers of the undead settlement or crudely birthed inside the fruit by the curse. You do, after all, see an arm burst out of the Great Wood itself in phase 2. There are lots of smaller enemies here, but rather than them feeling too much like annoying minions there to distract you from the main foe, they're mostly there to serve as fodder for the boss, which, despite being the object of their worship, shows no hesitation in wiping them out. Of course, as with just about all of Dark Souls 3's bosses, there's another phase where the ground is smashed open, dropping both player and Greatwood down into the depths below, with a long pale arm bursting out of its core, making you wonder what the hell else is hidden away in there within that dark back which makes up its bizarre body. Now this phase sucks to actually play, with how annoying the arm is to not get hit by, but it looks amazing. The boss's moveset expands here too of course, and I'm glad, because if you get lucky, you might just see what I consider to be possibly the single sickest attack in the game. That's right, not from Gale, or the Dragon Slayer armor, or Sister Frida, but the curse rotted Greatwood when it does this. That move terrifies the hell out of me because it's not swinging at you or spraying you with corpse juice, it's just standing up to its full height, letting you see how huge it really is before falling down, and I love it. To kick off the top 10, we have Rykard, Lord of Blasphemy. Just like Elden Ring does with all its demigods, we hear disturbing details about Rykard long before actually facing him, with Gideon Ofnir having some particularly damning thoughts on the man, or rather the thing. Despite the game's focus on the colour gold and the holy incandescent form of the central air tree, Elden Ring is a profoundly dark game with myriad horrors and cruelties, but Mount Gelmir, where Rikard works, is particularly dark. You can tell that conditions probably aren't going to be too pleasant over there, as its jagged volcanic landscape comes into view, and then you make it there and ascend the mountain, witnessing impossible numbers of scorched corpses littering the ground. Soldiers possessed by the flame of frenzy and a ruined minor air tree, and conditions throughout the manor are, if anything, worse, all of which serves to build anticipation for the meeting with Rikard, son of Radagon and Renala, and brother to Rani and Radan, a ruthless justiciar who dared to tread the path of blasphemy, rejecting the air tree and the golden order in favour of the way of the serpent. Indeed, it's not quite the form of Rikard that initially greets you upon entering his appalling lair, but the god-devouring serpent, coiled amidst a pool of magma, lashing out viciously and bathing the arena in poison and fire. It's not the serpent itself that I've chosen for number 10 though, but rather Rikard who appears in phase 2. He was of course there all along, except dormant, with its disturbing face only coming alive upon taking notice of this especially powerful tarnished warrior who's came here for an audience. 
I expected some big, monstrous design when I first came down here, especially after seeing the forms of the other demigods, but what I did not expect was this reveal. The serpent itself was very gnarly looking, sure, though not to the point of horror, but it all gets stepped up several notches in phase 2. Its form goes from looking somewhat recognisable to turning into a confusing writhing mass of scales and split snake flesh, with the hideous face of Rikard staring out from the back of the serpent's neck, his face being made to resemble serpent scales. The way the entire length of its body appears split open down the middle in this phase is a really gross effect, giving the boss a distinctly wet, fleshy look to complement the sheer horror of Rikard's visage, not to mention the garbled serpentine tones of his voice, sounding as if his transformation from a demigod into a god-devouring blasphemous monster is so far along that even normal speech is becoming increasingly difficult. The constantly grasping red hands which reach out from its split form and sword are another gruesome detail, with these being the still animated remains of his many victims who were either foolhardy enough to have sought an audience with the Serpent King or who were simply fed to him. In fact, the floor of the arena is essentially composed of a morbid fusion of charred bones and volcanic rock, though, as Rikard says, his aim is to devour the gods, to take on their power and grow in size, perhaps until he becomes large and strong enough to devour the earth tree and ultimately the world itself. As you'd expect, super chaotic fight, especially once Rikard's rancor starts getting thrown out to send screaming skulls at you, though the demigod's ultimate attack and one of the sickest attacks in the game has to be his taker's flame, but he lifts his sword high and... Ah, screw it, I'll just show you it. <laughs> At number 9 we've got another weird entity from Elden Ring. Estelle, natural born of the void. Like Fortisax, Estelle is an optional remembrance boss. That is unless you're going for the Age of the Stars ending, in which case it has to be taken down so as to make it up to the Moonlight Altar, where you can place the Ring of Dusk on one of Rani's four lovely hands. Upon coming down here for the first time after descending down the Scarlet Rot waterfall from the Grand Cloister, I really didn't know what to expect when I stepped through the large golden fog gate, but what I got what we all got was Estelle, quite possibly the most bizarre looking creature in all of Elden Ring, an enigmatic astral anomaly lurking down below under a false starry sky. Estelle moves around on six limbs, all of which look like arms and hands, yet largely function like legs. It also has two sets of long, translucent and multicoloured wings, a miniature version of which can actually be obtained in a chest in the southern Ul Palace ruins, crafted from a relic of this being who was said to have levelled the Eternal City with its devastating meteorites. Estelle's tail in particular though is the aspect that really draws the eye the second you enter the arena, the way it strangely shifts, being made out of a collection of multicoloured space debris to form a wicked whip with a cruel barb situated at the end for medium range attacks. If it's cosmic burst gravity laser doesn't get you first that is. By far the strangest aspect of Estelle's appearance though is its head. I can take all the cosmic strangeness, the weird tail, arms and wings, but when you attach what resembles a particularly large human head to it all, give it an enormous pair of clicking black pincers and hey, why not have a single glaring eye darting around from within this skull, then I start to get a little bit disturbed by your design, FromSoft. It's so bloody weird and out there, and cosmic, yet made that bit more unsettlingly human and morbid with the head, because it makes you think, if Estelle is a malformed star born in a flightless void far away, what's with the skull? What is this distant void? And what other forces lurk there? But as much as a shock to the system as it may be when you first see this boss though, it's certainly not entirely unique. Far earlier than this, you can encounter falling star beasts, then later, full grown falling star beasts, which now boast that single staring eye. Furthermore, in Ul Palace Ruins, there are a couple of malformed stars which look very similar to Estelle, except smaller, far more vulnerable and lacking any real degree of mobility. 
Furthermore, we also have to mention Estelle Stars of Darkness, a boss located at the end of the Yellow Annex Tunnel, which as far as I can tell, looks absolutely identical to the Natural Born of the Void. At first, I thought it was very lame that they'd so cheaply reused such an incredible looking boss, but then I realised that Estelle isn't the boss's actual name, but rather, it's more accurate to think of these fully matured beings as being Estelles, each having grown from a falling star beast at or near the beginning of its life cycle, just like a child grows into an adult, and a puppy grows into a dog. Aww, look at the puppy. Aww. Let's get back to Bloodborne though, and with a Chalice Dungeon boss no less. No, no not the man eater boar, but rather the headless, bloodletting beast found within the game's harder Thumeru chalices. Just like with several bosses on this list, there is another variant of this enemy, that being the headed bloodletting beast. And while my pick for number 8 does specifically go to the headless version, both of them look insane. Obviously, Bloodborne's thing is beasts with humans transforming into hairy monstrosities of varying size and shape, from your typical bipedal types, which still retain the ability to use weapons with dexterity, to your quadruped scourge beasts, stalking around on all fours with almost no trace of their former humanity remaining. Then, with the bosses you've got screaming monstrosities like the cleric beast, the noxious half-skinned blood-starved beast, or Vicar Amelia, looking like some bizarre crossover between a wolf and an elk. They all look bestial and intimidating in different ways, but then you've got the bloodletting beast, which I think looks the most bestial and primal of them all. It still has fur on its body, but the wolf aesthetic is pretty much gone, with this particular beast instead appearing far more primate in its bodily proportions, with its hunched over posture giving it this perpetual looming effect. These features alone would have been enough to make a terrifyingly memorable boss design, but on top of it all, it has a massive brutal gash along its back, which is essentially split open along the top for the whole fight, looking red and wet, with strings and strands of flesh still visible within the wound. But, and hear me out here, what if we took the bloodletting beast and then removed its head? What would happen then? Well then you would have the headless bloodletting beast, wouldn't you? A harder variant where its face appears to have been cleaved off by some powerful blade, though as we see it failed to actually kill the thing, and no wonder, because from within the bloody stump lurks a parasite, a giant worm. They're sinking cities with a giant worm. It's actually a pretty much identical concept to Sekiro's Guardian Ape, which is also given life after death due to the massive worm it's infested with, except Bloodborne did it four years earlier here. With Bloodborne not awarding the player with boss souls or the like, as the other games do, and with there not being any items in the game which appear to refer directly to the bloodletting beast, there's really not all that much to go on with this big guy, though apparently its Japanese name translates to host of the beast blood, which you can speculate as meaning that it is the first or one of the first known cases of beasthood, perhaps explaining why it looks so different from the other beasts. Also, there are theories that the bloodletting beast is actually Lawrence, not the flaming cleric beast found in the Hunter's Nightmare. The main piece of evidence for this is the shape of Lawrence's skull in the Grand Cathedral, which looks more similar in shape to the bloodletting beast's head than the cleric beast and would also go some way towards explaining what actually happened to this boss's head. Look, I don't know, you can get insanely deep and speculative when interpreting Bloodborne's lore, because it is a seriously deep and interesting game, but all I know is that I love this boss's design. In fact, I think it looks even cooler than most of the bosses from the base game and DLC, with a couple of exceptions. And one of those exceptions is the One Reborn, found at the end of Yahar Ghul after the Red Moon hangs low, preventing the way to the desiccated corpses of Mikolash and his head-caged compatriots from the school of Mensis. I was already in a constant state of horror when traversing through Yahar Ghul, with its amygdalas, cramped caskets, sewn together scourge beasts and Yarnamites materialising out of blood everywhere. But that all came to a head upon entering this large arena and seeing this unspeakable monstrosity that is the one reborn slowly emerge, or should I say slowly drip, out of the rancid portal which appears over the form of the red moon. The actual mechanics of the fight feel like something of an homage to the Tabernite from Demon's Souls, with there being a lower level where the boss is fought and then an upper level where two rows of projectile throwing enemies are. 
It's actually not a fight I massively enjoy, to be honest, particularly if you take it on at blood level 4, because it turns out that with all those kicking appendages, gore projectiles and blood explosions, it's pretty difficult to not get one hit KO'd. I don't think the one reborn is from Soft's best boss design or anything, otherwise I would have put it at number 1, but I do think it's up there with the most disgusting. It's a misshapen titan of torn flesh, fused bone, discoloured gristle and rotten juices, and every part of it is constantly, near independently shifting and writhing. Its animations make it look like rather than this being one hideous entity with one mind, it's instead a mass of ambiguously connected entities, all desperately lashing out at any other living thing which comes too close, though the upper torso and head situated at the boss's front seems to be the thing responsible for most of its larger movements. Or would this be its back section? Hell if I know. Like the bloodletting beast, there's really not all that much information to go on as far as exactly what the hell the One Reborn really is, and indeed, the One Reborn is a pretty odd name for a boss, but considering that Yahar Ghul is the base of the School of Mensis, the branch of the Healing Church which specialises in rituals, and when you look at the form of things like the particularly nightmarish scourge beasts in Yahar Ghul, it's fair to assume that the One Reborn may have been an attempt by the School of Mensis at creating a great one by sacrificing scores of Yarnamites to form a sort of flesh god. Perhaps the most prominent entity at the boss's front, or back, was even a scholar of Mensis who agreed to join in the ritual in the hopes of acting as the mind and will of this great one, though it's hard to tell whether the experiment was a success or failure. Either way... The thing is more terrible than I can describe. An incoherent jumble of organ, sinew and bone. At number 6, I've got another one from Elden Ring, and in fact, it's one of those bosses you really don't hear all that much about. Despite that, I've always thought the Dragonkin Soldier of Noxtella here has one of the most amazing designs in the game, and I love the concept behind it too. Once again, there are several other instances of the boss throughout the game, like the one collapsed in the Lake of Rot who rises up if you get too close, the ghostly ones who have the power to disappear and reappear around a section of the consecrated snowfields, though at the end of a cave in Ainzel River you emerge out into an overwhelmingly atmospheric chamber featuring an enormous yellow robed corpse sitting on a throne, with scores of even stranger figures on the lower level looking like larger versions of the messengers from Bloodborne and appearing to have been petrified in place mid-worship. It's not the arena that I'm overly concerned with though, but rather the enormous boss who thunders down from above as you draw near to the throned giant. Now, as we've discussed already, Elden Ring features a host of dragon variants, but then you've got, say, the magma worms, which look very different to the more conventional dragons but still have very draconic forms and abilities. But then you've got the Dragonkin, pale imitations of true dragons, born far beneath the surface of the lands between where there was no true sky to roam through and also lacking the ability to breathe fire as a dragon should, and nor are Dragonkin capable of producing yellow lightning, and certainly not red lightning. Instead, the Dragonkin Soldier of Noxtel is one of the very few enemies capable of using ice lightning, which is uniquely white and causes frost buildup, not unlike the ghost flame produced by the aforementioned Death Rite birds. These elements of the boss have always been super interesting to me, as is any design which plays around with the traditional form of a dragon to make them look more monstrous and even grotesque, but it's the boss's second phase that really does it for me, when it dramatically unfurls its sheathed wings, except instead of them being grand and golden like the game's other dragons, they're completely ruined and tattered, though it's not clear whether this dragonkin was born with such deformed wings or whether this has happened over time. The same applies to its legs, which it also lacks the use of, having to crawl around the arena instead, and the inside of its belly seems to have been either carved or rotted out over time. Its anatomy looks vaguely similar to that of the game's trolls in some respects, except more draconic. The lesser dragonkin bosses do not spread their wings or have the ability to use ice lightning, indicating that there's something special about this one which seems to be the strongest of its kind, yet tragically its power still pales in comparison to that of a true dragon. And at number 5, I have another dragon boss, though again it won't be the last dragon in this list. There's just too many great dragons to choose from. It's Dark Eater Medir from Dark Souls 3's The Ring City DLC. 
The Ring City was, of course, the final piece of content we got from the final game in the Dark Souls trilogy, and as such, it contains some truly amazing moments, enemies and indeed, bosses. In fact, I actually consider Slave Knight Gale to be the single greatest boss that FromSoft has ever created, but as well as Gale there's a certain dark dragon flying around, one you first hear about from Shira, Knight of Filionor, who, from behind the door, requests that you slay the dragon, not because it is inherently evil, but rather because over time it has consumed so much of the dark that it eventually consumed him, turning it into a near unstoppable force of destruction throughout the Ring City. You first encounter Madir just after the swamp section, requiring you dodge his regular bursts of dragon fire, just like in the old days. Then again a head where only his upper body is exposed, giving you an excellent opportunity to get well acquainted with his features, because this is one intimidating looking dragon, though the true fight doesn't take place until later, if you choose to drop into his dark lair. Just like I said when discussing Fortisax, the best dragons are the ones which have some sort of twist or extra bit of spice to their design and or mechanics, and Madir's is of course that he is infused with the dark. You can see traces of his presence back in the swamp section over in the corner where the dragon slayer armour can be found, with the telltale sign being the dark crystal growths caused by his tainted dragon fire, and indeed the same purple crystalline effect can be seen on Madir's scales themselves. It's not restricted to just his outer lair though, because Madir's own fire breath has been infused with the dark, with his flames having a black core, kinda like Kao meets fire from Dark Souls 1, though Madir can also follow up some attacks with focused dark beams. In fact, this is by far his most dangerous attack, with him only unleashing it in phase 2, prompting most players to panic, and spam the living hell out of that roll button and probably still get hit anyway, and one shot KO'd, which sucks, but regardless, one of the most awesome attacks in the game. I'm a sucker for a good laser move, especially one that looks like this. Although you can't just see Madeir as a big, crazy dragon, his fall from grace story is very good, and well summarised in the item description for the frayed blade boss weapon that can be made from his soul. The once exquisite blade is now stained black, and frayed at the hilt. Without its sheath, it will soon crumble into nothing pretty damn tragic, because by this point this dragon has completely lost itself, and although it still clearly retains its ferocity, this seems to be more from madness inflicted by the dark, which has also began taking a toll on its form, hence its tattered wings, which are now full of holes, having been made brittle and rigid. Medir's story is essentially very similar to those of several other of Dark Souls' great but corrupted legendary figures like Artorius, the Abyss Watchers and Gale. At number 4 I have saw fit to grace this list from a boss from Sekiro, it's the Guardian Ape. The Guardian Ape happens to be my favourite boss from Sekiro, though interestingly enough, this is not because I absolutely love fighting the thing. The boss I most enjoy fighting would probably be either Owl Father or Inner Genichiro, but there's something really, really special about the Guardian Ape, and that is its phase 2 transformation. Don't get me wrong, it's a great looking boss right from the outset especially with the enormous sword sticking out of its neck, but at the same time it's really not all that novel or interesting to behold. It's a big powerful ape, here to guard the lotus of the palace, a white flower the ape set here to offer to his bride, and as such, it walks like an ape and it talks like an ape. Well, I guess it doesn't really talk, though it does fart directly in your face from time to time. But as great as all that is, you beat it and it eventually goes down. Dude, I cannot describe the excitement and hype that I felt when I first saw this boss get back up. It was literally one of the most amazing moments I've ever experienced when playing a game, to the point where I was messaging my friends, telling them to look up the Guardian 8 boss on YouTube. You've got to see this boss, it's the sickest thing ever. It's not just the whole resurrection aspect that I love though, it's the complete change in the way this thing moves. Now, it positively undulates around the arena mimicking the motion of a worm, almost completely losing all resemblance to a primate, and now more resembling a massive hairy insect. Even its fighting style changes completely, 
with the bare-fisted slams and pounds gone in favour of uncannily dexterous swordplay, though broken up by the occasional terror-inducing shriek from the head to keep you away. Even the tone of the music changes here, sounding far more dissonant and demented to make the encounter feel that much more off-putting. And if you're savvy enough to make use of the Spear Shinobi tool, you can yank out the giant centipede within, which is as gross as it is effective. I guess the only slightly diminishing aspect with the Guardian Ape is that they went and repeated it a bit later on in the game with the exact same moveset, except now with a smaller partner, kinda cheapening the first encounter a little bit, but not nearly to the extent where it was ruined for me, and at least you do get to permanently kill the centipede here with the Mortal Blade. Well, back to Bloodborne for number 3, and the boss I have chosen is Ludwig the Accursed, found at the end of the Hunter's Nightmare level in the superb Old Hunters DLC. You might even be on the DLC for a fair wee while before actually running into Ludwig or any boss, instead taking on the Old Hunters with their crude weaponry and traversing through the blood swamps of the Hunter's Nightmare, but past all this, you enter into the lair of the beast responsible for all this blood and its name is Ludwig, the first hunter of the church. Of course, German was the very first hunter of all, but once the healing church was established, Ludwig was its first and most honoured and revered hunter. However, those glory days are long, long since gone, and just as is the fate of every hunter who goes blood drunk, he is trapped and doomed in the hunter's nightmare, except instead of spending the rest of eternity as a roaming old hunter, slaughtering never-ending groups of beasts like his lost brethren outside, Ludwig has been transformed into the most terrible and hideous of all beasts. Like several of Bloodborne's monster designs, Ludwig is something of a mishmash of different beings, of a man and a horse in this case, except with a far more nightmarish twist compared to most other beasts. I mean, sure, Vicar Amelia might have been pretty bloody monstrous, but did she have an extra head with eyes lined along the inside of her mouth, or legs coming off of legs? No. This encounter does something very similar to the Guardian Ape encounter too, with a form posture and behaviour of the boss undergoes a significant shift in phase 2, except instead of it coming completely out of nowhere, there are aspects of Ludwig's design which betrays some existing elements of intelligence and humanity, even despite the near constant bestial shrieks and screams which characterise phase 1, like how one of his eyes remains somewhat clear and intelligent and how he still sports a tattered church cape on his back. Furthermore, although it's easy to miss with how mobile the boss is, and how distracted you're likely to be by its claws, hooves and biting maw, the Holy Moonlight Sword is there on its back in Phase 1, except of course in its non-arcane enchanted state. But then that incredible Phase 2 cutscene happens, where, for a time at least, Ludwig is snapped out of the influence of beasthood by the pale green glow of his Holy Moonlight Sword a weapon born of the same tiny beings of light that he would see when his eyes were closed, offering him guidance and some sort of solace when in the midst of some brutal, blood-drenched hunt. In Phase 2, the human side takes over, with Ludwig's animalistic screams being replaced by more human grunts, his multi-legged stance taking on a far more graceful and dexterous two-legged stance, and his claw swipes and foot stomps being replaced by sweeping sword swipes and arcane EOE attacks, complementing the blood red of the arena with waves of pale green. Ludwig is similar to Artorius in that we hear of him throughout the base game and can even get a hold of his weapons, but when you actually encounter him in the depths of the DLC, by that point the legendary figure is lost and ruined, and in sad need of being put down. Okay, this is the last dragon boss on the list, I promise. But sweet Jesus, how could I bloody well not include Dragon Lord Placidisax in my list of all-time sickest monster boss designs? You can be forgiven 
for completely missing Placidus Axe 2 on your first run through Crumbling for Ram as Yua, because the path to his arena is very inconspicuously placed, and even once you reach the end of the bridge of floating rubble there doesn't appear to be any immediate way forward, but upon laying down in a crevice beside the violently whirling cyclone, time itself reverses, reforming the structure of the ancient Colosseum where Dragon Lord Placidisax resides, not stalking around or even flying about, but rather simply floating there, silently and anomalously, only unfurling its ancient stony wings upon your approach. In fact, the boss's name is literally a combination of two Latin words, with Placidus meaning calm or mild, and Saxum referring to a large stone or rock. Indeed, Placidisax truly does look so ancient that his scales have begun turning to stone, with some being coloured white and others being coloured gold, and these two colours are actually represented by the white coloured sombre ancient dragon smithing stone and the golden ancient dragon smithing stone, with both these stones being literal scales from Placidisax, who is said to have been Elden Lord even before the age of the Air Tree or so the item description for its remembrance claims, contradicting the in-game belief that Godfrey was the first ever Elden Lord, and making Crumbling for Amazua feel that much more mysterious, especially when you see its version of the Elden Ring. By the time we encounter Placidus Axe, it only has two heads remaining, though it is depicted as having had four on the old Lord's Talisman. Its Hydra-esque head situation is just one of several physical aspects that sets it apart from other dragons though, with the most striking being the colour of its fire which, instead of being yellow or dark, is a bright gold. In fact, the only other being in the game capable of breathing golden fire is the equally mysterious Elden Beast. One thing the Elden Beast cannot do however, is the Placidisax's Ruin attack, which is essentially a doubled up golden version of Medir's Dark Beam, and which looks just as, if not more, incredible and difficult to avoid. Like the other ancient dragons, this boss also uses red lightning, being capable of calling it forth from the ground of the Colosseum with a skyward roar, but as well as this, it has the Bolt of Placidisax attack, generating a spectral spear of red lightning within its hand before detonating it after a brief hush in the music to build the dread and anticipation for the coming blast. The form of the bolt actually looks pretty much identical to the bolt of Gransax in Landel, which also happened to be the weapon I was using in this footage very poetic. One physical aspect of Placidisax that is totally unique to it though is its ability to convert itself into cloud form, dematerialising its physical body and rematerialising as a storm cloud before heaving its vast craggy form back down at the player for several assaults from spectral claws composed of red lightning. In my view, Dragon Lord Placidisax is the single sickest dragon design FromSoft have ever created. Before Elden Ring, that title was held by Dark Eater Medir, but the Dragon Lord is something really special. In fact, I came extremely close to having it as the number one pick for this list, but in the end, a different sort of lord won out. So I maybe should have had this boss included in the armoured boss design video I put out last week because he does technically wear armour, but I did not include it because you can't actually get Godric's armour and because his form is so monstrous that he barely even resembles a human anymore, thus I'm including him here, though in truth he could fit into either category. As ever, there's a lot of build up and anticipation before you come across this demigod. You might spend a lot of time wandering Limgrave beforehand, or maybe even the Weeping Peninsula, coming across a few bosses, but all the while Stormvale Castle looms in the distance, a huge stone fortress, blighted by thorns, yes, but if anything, this feature gives it an even more intimidating air. Of course, you have to fight Margit, the fell omen beforehand, who cuts a very intimidating figure in his own right, not exactly making for a warm welcome onto the castle grounds, but Regardless, you soldier on through the castle, likely catching sight of a few horrors along the way, like the grafted scion, prowling around in a feast hall morbidly adorned with a multitude of bloodied limbs hanging from the ceiling, heavily foreshadowing the encounter with the demigod himself, the one Rodrika refers to as the spider. Now, Elden Ring has some of the greatest boss intros of any FromSoft game, but the intro to the Godric fight might just be the single greatest. 
We are given snippets of information throughout the game which describe this demigod as being something of a dishonourable coward, such as the item description for the Mimic's Veil, vale, where it is written that when Godric was hounded away from Laendale, this was one of the items he stole away with him, implying that he used it to hide and escape, and there's also the sword monument near Lake Agil in Lingrave which reads, Godric the Golden, humiliated, having tasted defeat by the blade of Mikola, now on his knees, begging for mercy. Even so, by the time you encounter him in the castle, there's really no trace of weakness or cowardice to his countenance, because he has artificially overcome his physical weaknesses through the act of grafting, a process where he removes the limbs of tarnished invaders to his castle, gradually adding bulk and strength to his previously frail form to the point of grotesque excess, to where now arms sprout out from his upper body, and where his main arms and legs are essentially amalgams of smaller arms and legs, not just from humans but also trolls, whatever it takes to make him feel more powerful and godlike. Godric's form is extremely disturbing, but my favourite aspect of him really is his desperation to be seen as more than he really is. It's clear that he idolises Lord Godfrey, hence the large portrait of the man in the feast hall, and by his choice of weapon, an axe, just as Godfrey uses an axe, and Godric's is even emblazoned with a lion, which is Godfrey's symbol, as per his beast advisor, Sarosh, always clinging to his back. Speaking of his axe, one of those details that somehow manages to be both subtle while staring you right in the face is the smaller axe carried by one of his smaller arms at the right side of his body, which mimics the motions of the larger one. Yet again though, just like with the Guardian Ape at number 4 and Ludwig the Accursed at number 3, we have an insanely, insanely sick phase transition cutscene. I mentioned how hyped I was after seeing the Guardian Ape get back up after death, so much so that I had to order my friends to watch it. Well, this cutscene had the exact same effect on me. You know one of those moments in a game, or even a movie or show, where what you're seeing is so awesome that you can't speak, where all you can do is watch with your mouth hanging open in delighted, exhilarated astonishment. Yeah, this was one of those moments for me, to the point where I was glad when I went on to immediately die in phase 2, because it meant I got to watch the cutscene all over again. As well as it being really cool though, I've always found it to be pretty bloody unsettling. The low pitched gurgling sound the dragon head makes as it comes to life is horrible and again, the visual effect is enhanced by the dragon's empty lifeless eye sockets, and how when you look at the way it's connected to Godric's arm, there's just a mass of stretched pink flesh there between it and the dragon. I think Godric the Grafted is FromSoft's most disgusting, disturbing and sick boss design. The One Reborn is certainly up there in terms of pure disgust, but Godric is on another level because rather than him being just a foul mass of wet flesh and gristle, he's a great character with a fascinating history and personality, and with some of the best dialogue and cutscenes in the game. And it's all summed up perfectly after you defeat him only to see Gostok repeatedly smashing his boot into Godric's head, which now suddenly looks absurdly small and pathetic, and not the least bit godlike. Excuse for a lord you were. <laughs> Craven to the bone. Pushing me about like that, and after all that grafting, where did that get you? Look down on me, would ya? Godric, you filthy slug. Feel it. Feel it. Feel my bloody wrath. And there you have it. There is my list. Before putting it together, I actually expected that Bloodborne would be the most frequently cited game here, but no, it ended up being Elden Ring, which simply has a lot of amazing monster designs. Sadly, even though I would have loved to, I just did not see fit to include a single Dark Souls 1 or Dark Souls 2 boss here. I considered Ceaseless Discharge and Gravelord Nito, but they're just not quite up there for me, and whereas Dark Souls 2 absolutely was up there when it came to its armoured boss designs, its monster game is relatively weak, though if I had to mention a few of its best offerings, I would say The Last Giant, The Giant Lord, and Sin, The Slumbering Dragon. Folks, please allow me to give a fond thank you to my kind patrons for their support for the channel. And on that note, cheers for watching and cheerio.